Welcome, welcome. Thank you so much for joining. Welcome to Windsor Dermatology's Healthy Skin Highlights. Tonight is our second episode of a 14 lecture series. Throughout the lecture series, the providers at Windsor Dermatology will discuss multiple different common dermatological conditions. Tonight, it is my pleasure to present Dr. Jerry Bagel. Dr. Bagel is a nationally recognized expert in research and treatment of psoriasis, so much so that he is I just messed up, I'm so sorry. So much so that he is a member on the NPF board of directors. However, Dr. Bagel doesn't just focus on psoriasis. He is also a nationally recognized researcher and lecturer of eczema. Dr. Bagel has been named top doctor in numerous publications, including, but not limited to, Castle Connolly Medical Top Doctors of the New York Metro area, New Jersey Top Doctors by New Jersey Life, and received the Patient, Patient's Choice Award in 2008, as well as the Insider New Jersey for 2013 and 2015. Dr. Bagel is an editor of Practical Dermatology and the assistant editor of Psoriasis Forum. He has published extensively on the topic of eczema in such journals as the Journal of American Academy of Dermatology and the Journal of Drugs and Dermatologic, Dermatological. Um, he's also a clinical professor of dermatology at Mount, Mount Sinai Medical School. There will be time at the end of the presentation for questions. If you have any questions, please type them in the text box below. Dr. Bagel will address them at the end of the discussion. We are also excited to tell you about our raffle. For those of us that are not staff, here is a chance to win a custom Windsor, Dermatolo Windsor Dermatology coffee mug. Um, let us know in the comments um, your name, your email, your phone number, and how you found out about tonight's episode. We will pick a winner at random and we will let them know tomorrow morning. We at Windsor Dermatology are thrilled you took the time to join us for this exciting episode of Healthy Skin Highlights, an educational web series with Windsor Dermatology hosted by Dr. Jerry Bagel. So now it is my pleasure to officially introduce Dr. Jerry Bagel. Thank you, everybody. Thank you for coming. Um, before I get started, I'd like to thank a few people who have spearheaded this healthy skin highlights, which I've been wanting to do for many years and the technology seems to have worked with us now. I'd like to thank Alexa Hetzel and Jenna Spatz and Shana Flanders <clears throat> and also Alicia Hyman for helping putting this all together. And uh, with that, you know, greetings from the Eczema Center of Central New Jersey here, the home of Windsor Dermatology in East Windsor, New Jersey. And tonight we're gonna let it rip with eczema. The first thing I'm gonna get into is what's it look like? I mean, it just went backwards. But now it's jumping. Um, what's it look like? Well, this is obviously a child. And most of the time, the most common times for people to get eczema is in infancy, between birth and the age of, it's jumping, with the age of three, four years old, um, atopic dermatitis occurs on the face, the trunk, and basically it can get raw and red and scaly. Now, eczema can also occur in adulthood. In fact, there have been case reports where people have had eczema at the age for the first time at the age of 106 reported in the literature. Nonetheless, the most common times are early infancy and also it then can occur during adolescence and even during adulthood. But about most of the ch kids that get eczema as, an, as a kid, outgrow it about 40 to 50% of the time by the time that they're 10 years old. The problem is when it continues on longer into life, it becomes much more recalcitrant and much more difficult to treat. 
and has a much greater impact on the quality of life of the individual. Because you can look here on this child's foot and it's very common on the creases of individuals like the feet behind the um, knees known as the popliteal fossa, the antecubital fossa in front of the elbows. And you see here, one of the manifestations of eczema is the skin gets thickened and that's called lichenification. And that's from scratching, chronic scratching resulting in thickening of the skin, making it very difficult to treat and making it very difficult to stop itching. Some physicians consider eczema more of an itch than a rash because it's the itch that, that induces the rash to occur. This is a classic, classic case of what you can see here behind the legs. Anacute popliteal fossa, you see redness, you see it's raised, you see it's even a little kind of like oozy. I mean, and that means it's probably infected, known as impetigenization. And commonly, atopic dermatitis becomes infected. And why it becomes infected is because in the upper level of the skin, the epidermis, the upper layer of the skin usually produces antimicrobial peptides. That's right. Antibiotics are generally produced in normal skin to help us fight infection. After all, the skin is our largest organ. The skin is our largest immune organ to help us prevent infection, to help us prevent external um, phenomenon that are dangerous to come into us and also to prevent us from losing water. And what happens when in eczema is that the eczematous skin does not produce enough antimicrobial peptides, and hence there's an increase in infection, mostly staph infection, that makes it again more difficult, more inflamed to treat. Sometimes we can get eczema on the face, commonly, and many times because eczema, the skin gets open, it's almost like a little raw. It allows for more allergens to percolate through the epidermis into the dermis and induce a contact dermatitis. And so therefore there are many people with atopic dermatitis, the other name for eczema, that's also uh, has a compounding contact dermatitis. It could be to nickel, it could be to sensitizations, it can be to sensitizers, it could be to hair dyes, it can be to wash, it could be to toothpaste, it could be to lots of things. And we can do patch testing on people, which we do often at Windsor Dermatologists to help eradicate any exacerbating contact factors. But that's the other point I'd like to make here with atopic dermatitis is that it's a triad. And people with eczema also have a high frequency of asthma and hay fever. And also, I mean, 50% of people with asthma do have atopic dermatitis in some studies and vice versa. In addition, people have a high frequency of nasopharyngitis. They have nasal rhinitis and they can have also conjunctivitis, inflammation of the eye. Now, in, with kids, there's an increased frequency of ADD because people with eczema, as I'm saying, what's going on? They're itching, they're scratching, they're not staying still, they're not focusing, they're having trouble focusing at school, and there's an increase in ADD in children with atopic dermatitis. Look here, you could see here exactly like sometimes you can have eczema on 2% of your body and it can itch and itch and itch. And also you can have it on 80% of your body, which becomes, you know, like non-functional um, to the point where your quality of life is significantly impaired to the point where sleeping is really impossible because you're so inflamed, you're so itchy, you cannot sleep. Consequently, 
you might still need to go to work because you got to pay your bills. And there's a term called presenteeism. Like you go to work, but you're so sleepy, you're not really there. You're not functioning. You're on the verge of losing your job because you're just tired from so much scratching. And so, yeah, and there's also absenteeism. And there's clearly an increased frequency of people who don't get to work or unemployed or disemployed because of eczema. I mean, as you heard in the, what um, Alicia said, you know, yeah, I'm really into psoriasis. That's true. I've spent a lot of time taking care of people with psoriasis, but, and I probably have spent five times as many, see five times as many people with psoriasis as eczema. And I've probably written five times as many disability forms for people with eczema than psoriasis. Because even though psoriasis looks terrible and makes people feel bad, eczema is like when I see them, it's like I start itching. It's like you feel they're itching. And it's also an extremely capricious disease. And what I mean by capricious, it waxes and wanes. Like we put people in clinical trials here with eczema and we could see them on one day when we're screening them to see if they're gonna possibly be randomized for the study. And they could have 15% of their body covered with psoriasis. They can come back three weeks later to be randomized. They could have 30% of their body you know, involved with eczema. Why? Because there's other factors besides cold, hot, sweating, stress is a big one. COVID really has in, in really made a lot of people's eczema get really bad, more than it has with psoriasis. I'm surprised, but it really has flared a lot of people with atopic dermatitis. Again, you could see here the glistening aspects in the antecubital fossa, the arms of this individual beckoning for antibiotic or at least other kinds of therapy. And I'm just gonna jump into a little bit of treatment right now. So there's gonna be a lot of discussion on treatment, you know, writing prescriptions and clinical trials and all the new research, but the basics, basic premise in my opinion on treatment is this avoid hot water in the shower avoid harsh soaps like ivory don't take freak frequent showers or baths if you do better to use a vino powder and oatmeal powder and oatmeal powder in the bathtub and soak lukewarm water for about 20 minutes maybe use dove soap and if you're gonna use a moisturizer cream, not a lotion because lotions have too many other medicine um, uh, ingredients in it that might irritate you, a cream or an ointment like Aquaphor or Cetaphil cream and put it all over your body and then take antihistamines like Benadryl or Zyrtec at night to stop the itching. Avoid, avoid wool clothing. Um, don't go from real cold to real hot or vice versa, wear layered clothing and take off layers accordingly. And those are some of the basic premises of taking care of your skin with atopic dermatitis. Now, another point is something called a bleach bath. And if you have um, infected skin like this person does, it would be uh, prudent instead of using uh, a, um, a vino powder to maybe take you know, a quarter of a cup of Clorox and put it in a large tub in the bathtub and then soak. And that will kill the staff that's on your skin without having to take systemic antibiotics. You can see here, sometimes, you know, eczema isn't straightforward in the way it looks to the dermatologic eye. And sometimes one does need to take a biopsy that will show, and I'll show you later, but what will show is that there's, you have epidermis and dermis. And in the epidermis, which there's like about, you know, seven or eight different layers of cells, what you're gonna see is a separation of all the cells. And that's called spongiosis. It's where your sp the, the cells are separated. And the reason they're separated is twofold. And I'll go through it again later, but once I'll go through it now, it's twofold because there is a molecule called filagrin and filagrin is a protein. And when it's produced normally, the epidermal cells stick together. 
And when it's not produced normally, there's a mutation genetics, then it's not produced and the epidermal cells separate. And when they separate, what happens? I told you before, all the other bad stuff could percolate through the epidermal cells and go into the dermis where, and this is a new concept I'm bringing up, it activates T cells, lymphocytes, white blood cells, and those white blood cells produce chemicals that make your skin break down and also produce an, um, an immunoglobulin called IgE, which increases histamine. And we've all heard that histamine makes the skin itch. So basically you have a pathology within the epidermis as well as within the dermis that results in a breakdown of the skin so that there's a lot of itching going on and there's a lot of foreign substances percolating into through the skin that's activating an inflamed pr immune process that shouldn't be happening. So you could see here, sometimes it could be in a sun distribution that you might have to rule out other disorders like lupus or dermatomyositis, uncommon, but um, you know it just has different manifestations in it. and it looks different for in the children as compared to adults. Like in children, it's more of a central distribution, face, abdomen, groin, whereas in the, in the adults, it tends to be um, arms and legs and a little bit in the trunk. And like I said, it could be on 1% of your body, or 99% of your body. And it could change from 20% to 10% or vice versa within a couple of weeks based upon your emotional status, heat, allergies that could exacerbate it as well. So what do we see here? Let's try to put this all together. We're dealing with, it can happen anytime, but a lot of times it happens in kids. It can happen early. I see a lot of adults lately that have it. I actually think there's an increase in eczema that's happening. Um, people have dry skin. It comes and goes, comes and goes, but the hallmark is paritis, itching. Itching is the hallmark of this disease because even people who their eczema is on 20% of their body, if you get it down to itching of hardly anything, they're feeling better. And I look at two compo three components when I see my patients. One, and I ask them all this, in the last three days on a zero to 10, how much have you been itching? And if they're over a three, that's a lot. And I get plenty of sevens. Then over the last three days, how much, many, how much has it infected your sleep? And then I look at body surface area, percent of the body involved, and how inflamed it is on a zero to four. And with that, you could start making some handles on how to treat. So, you know, it's, you, and we're looking at down below, we're looking at how red it is, how oozy it is, how much like catification it is. If you see excoriations, people that are scratching. And remember, it's a result of an immune dysregulation of the dermis and also a decrease in the proper proteins synthesis in the epidermis. Looking at some numbers, lots of people have it. You can look at the numbers yourself. I don't have to read it for you, but it's about one and a half million people that are adults with, with moderate to severe psoriasis, eczema. Um, about 3 million people overall in the United States with eczema that are adults. So it's not just a, ch a kid disease. It, it, it trans fires throughout the entire population. And this is what we can do. There are some really, the beauty of this talk today is that about four years ago, there was a new drug that became FDA approved that we actually did research on here in, at Windsor Dermatology for four years before called Dupixin. And it's a real breakthrough drug, a relatively safe drug. It's a shot, sub Q every other week. And if you look here, you could see within 16 weeks, somebody went from all those excoriations on the left to pretty good, not perfect, but this person, even though they weren't perfect, 
they were hardly itching. And you could add a little topical steroids to that in this adolescent individual, it would help them out a lot. And if you look at these individuals, you can see here going from a IgA of four, which means real like hyperpigmentation, real inflamed eczema, it's raised, there's like a serous exudate. And within four weeks, I'm sorry, 16 weeks, that's one shot every other week, person's pretty clear. And ditto with this individual. So, you know, there's some really good treatments and what's happening, I'm trying to show before, here up above is normal skin. And you see how you're beautiful, this is called the stratum corneum. It's the upper layer of the skin. And then the epidermis is the up, very upper layer. This is the stratum corneum. These are actually dead cells. This is all just protein that's protecting you from the outside world. You need this. And you have the dermis, which supports the growth of the epidermis. And you see how the epidermis here is all regular and stuff. It looks like pretty. Well, in eczema, first of all, what do you see down here? All these blue dots, they're all T cells. They're lymphocytes, they're immune cells. There's a, a significant immune response that shouldn't be happening. And this immune response is inducing an epidermis where you see these separations a little bit between each cell, that spongiosis and also is irregular. And you see how the stratum corneum is not really normal. So therefore stuff can get in easier. So you see the real pathology under the microscope. And what we can do with some of the newer medications is stop all these T cells from being there, which stops them from producing chemicals that make the skin grow abnormal and turn it into normal skin because we fight the abnormal immune cells and the molecules that the immune cells produce from inducing the pathology. So that if you look at this rather complicated slide, you can see here that with atopic dermatitis, you get itching, you get skin barrier defects, you know, the epidermis breaks down and you get all these T types of T cell molecules that are inducing this whole response, which is basically known as a T helper two response. And this T helper two response produces a few different molecules, interleukin four and interleukin 13, which are the most important because they are involved in changing B cells, which produce IgG to IgE and IgE produces histamine. So if you can block this IL-13 and IL-4, then you can stop the alteration of B cells from producing IgG to IgE, stopping it, therefore IgG is produced, no more histamine is produced, and you go back to your normal state of normal skin. And that's kind of the basis of where the research is right now. Now, fortunately, these are the treatments that are available. For mild eczema, or even in some people where we have other combination of therapy, we can use topical therapies, corticosteroids, calcineurin inhibitors. The beauty of corticosteroids is they work fast. The disadvantage is they can thin your skin out, especially in children. And you don't wanna to use too, too much because you could get too much absorption and then you could have steroid side effects. The calcineurin inhibitors are, are really safe Sometimes they irritate a little bit, but sometimes we go through that because they don't, they don't thin your skin out. You don't have to worry about using them around your eye and getting cataracts. So they're, they're a, a nice alternative to have. Beyond topical steroids, when we get into more moderate to severe atopic dermatitis, what we used to use a lot of was corticosteroids, systemic steroids, prednisone, Prednisone could be 40 milligrams a day to start, could be 60, depending upon how big the person is. Might put them on it for two to three weeks. It helps short-term, but never long-term. You put somebody on cortisone, 
that has lichenification, they come off cortisone, they're still gonna have lichenification. They're still gonna go back to flaring. In fact, you know, my associate, Dr. Simone, never uses systemic steroids. She's a pediatric dermatologist and she's taught me a lot on this. It's, um, you know, if it's not, it's like in psoriasis, you use it and you, the, the person gets worse when they're off of it. So fortunately I have alternatives now, so I don't have to use it as much. Hardly at all. Methotrexate is a, meth is a medication that's very toxic to the liver. We don't use it much. Cyclosporin, I use. Cyclosporin is a medication that was first used to help prevent kidney transplant rejections in 1980 at the University of Pittsburgh and has been learned to be a immunomodulatory medication, an immunosuppressive medication. And in severe cases of atopic dermatitis, real severe, where I need to turn them around quick, I might put them on cyclosporin for a few months. I can do that. Now, better in younger people than in older people because there is risks with the kidneys, there's hypertension, there's other minor side effects as well. But as a crisis management therapy, I like to have cyclosporin in my back pocket. Phototherapy, ultraviolet light helps the skin. Ultraviolet light in many cases can help people with atopic dermatitis. Narrowband UVB, totally safe, no increase in skin cancers. We take the three wavelengths of light that work the best, that give the least amount of damage, but it's three times a week for 12 weeks. And it's a commitment but it can be beneficial for the treatment of atopic dermatitis. The second form of phototherapy is called PUVA, and it's photochemotherapy, where you actually take pills 75 minutes before you come in for light treatment. It is extremely effective. However, it can, over time, increase the risk of skin cancers. So we don't use it that often. The big, the big boy on the block or the big treatment on the block is Dupixin. Dupixin, as I mentioned, uh, has been FDA approved for four years. It's a monoclonal antibody. It's injected sub-Q every other week and it binds IL-4 and IL-13, thereby it decreases the amount of IL-4 and IL-13, it decreases the amount of histamine, it decreases the amount of T cells, it increases the amount of, of um, antimicrobial peptides on the surface of the epidermis. And within four weeks, most people are going to feel a lot better. So you get to take two shots the first week and then one shot thereafter every other. And within four weeks, about 50% of the people are going to have a significant improvement in itching. Overall, it works about 65 to 70% of the time. The safety profile is excellent. It's not going to, you, you've seen it on TV already, somewhere after the world news in the beginning of Jeopardy, you've seen it, but it's like there's no increase in malignancies, there's no increase in tuberculosis, there's no increase in, in lymphoma, there's no increase in inflammatory bowel disease. The only thing is, 20% of the people can get conjunctivitis. Now, 10% of all people with eczema get conjunctivitis anyway, and almost no people have to stop the, to fix it because of, of conjunctivitis. And there's also 5% that get this red face. So that's the big side of, effect from this drug. Otherwise, it's nothing that I'm like going to freak out about, like with the other biologics. And it's really been a godsend for the treatment of eczema in the last four years. Having said that, the 19, the 2020s is the era of eczema therapy research. And there are probably about four new medications that are going to be FDA approved in 2021 for the treatment of atopic dermatitis. The one that I'm most uh, excited about is already FDA approved for rheumatoid arthritis. It's called Rinvoke. Rinvoke, upadidacin. And it's a it's an oral medication. It's a pill that you take once a day. And I think efficacy wise, it works as well as Dupixit. Maybe a little better, but probably will have to do, people will have to get blood draws because there's some potential mild adverse events that need to be monitored early on. 
There's also two other medications similar to Dupixit, uh, tralokinumab and lebrachizumab. They're both also subcutaneous shots that are going to be FDA approved probably this year or early next year. And then there's about three other oral medications and they're all part of what's known as the JAK inhibitor. They're really cool if you under, want to understand the science. They're actually pills and they get into the cells that are important and they actually inhibit the DNA from transcribing the proteins that are involved in the inflammatory process. So it's a specific to the point of gene inhibition that results in the benefit of these medications. So that's really my talk for tonight on atopic dermatitis. Um, my heart goes out to these people because they, they suffer a lot. Um, fortunately, Dupixin is now FDA approved down to the age of six. So there's benefit to, for children, at least to that age. Um, I, I think that it's a lot easier taking care of people with eczema today than it was five years ago, but I still think many people aren't aware of the therapeutic options that are relatively safe to help them. And that's kind of one of the reasons that I'm glad to be here tonight to promote that information so people can have more options in increasing their quality of life. So I want to thank you all, and I know there's going to be some questions, but I really want to thank you all for like uh, participating in the Healthy Skin Highlights of February 9th, 2021. Okay, so okay, so here's some questions I have. Uh, what eczema products do you recommend over the counter for people who can't afford a doctor? If you can't afford a doctor, call us and let me see if I can help you anyway. How's that? Yeah, okay, I'd like that better because um, I think that it's too specific a question to answer. But as I mentioned, you know, avoid hot water in the shower, use lukewarm water, mild soap like Dove and put Cetaphil cream on twice a day. Is, is eczema hereditary? 100%, yes. It may not be that your mother or father had it, but somewhere along the line, it's a genetic disorder. There's genes, multiple genes that are involved in making up the integrity of the skin and, the, and, and your um, immune system, and they're all linked to your her heredity. What do you think is the biggest stigma for people with eczema? That's a good question. I'm gonna say this. I think people with eczema tend to look older and they know it because they they get a lot of like, you know, like under their eyes get darkened from all the pigmentation and the scratching. And, you know, it, they get a lot more itching and and I think that's it. And, and I also think that there's the stigma of them sitting around scratching and people noticing them scratching. So I, I think that's really part of it, part of the stigma. Um, what are the topical steroid side effects? You know, there's lots of different classifications of steroids and, and the stronger ones like clobetazole, I mean, they're, they're pretty rough. I mean, if you, you shouldn't be using them on your face, on, on your neck, under your arms, under your breast, in your groin, because they're going to result in stria. They're going to result in atrophy. They're going to result in thinning of your skin. That's the biggest risk with topical steroids. Uh, those are the biggest risks. I mean, if it, you're with a kid, um, you know, that's small and the, and the body surface area is rather small, um, you can get a lot of systemic steroid absorptions and then you can get into the whole Cushingoid syndrome. So, but that's rarely going to happen in an adult. But the bottom line is you shouldn't use more than 60 grams of topical steroids a week. If red and exacerbated, is there a definite indication of infection or not necessarily? Uh, excoriated, red and excoriated. It's not necessary that it could be, but I bet you if you did a culture, it's gonna be. So if it's that you know, excoriated, there's a good chance due to the fact that there's no antimicrobial peptides being synthesized in that group, in that eczema to skin, there's a good chance that it could be infected. If you're seeing red and excoriated, you wanna get that treated. And now you're on the, it's not just, you know, you might have MRSA, but it's also that as long as that skin's infected, you could throw as much topical steroids on there. You could use Dupexit. It's gonna be harder to treat. 
So you want it because that's going to be promoting more inflammation. So you want to get rid of the infection as much as possible. On the other hand, go back to bleach baths. You don't need to take antibiotics every time you come on to get a, a red and excoriated lesion. Um, should using a calcineurinated, calcineurin inhibitor like Elidil completely eradicate eczema or does it only act to reduce its appearance? Let me tell you about Elidil and all these medications like the calcineurin inhibitors. It's like this. Let's say you use, let's say you're like, let me see if you show this. You have eczema and it's like this. Boom, boom, boom. Every month you have a flare. And let's say you use Elidil twice a day. Maybe you'll get a flare every other month. So it's going to decrease the frequency of eczema, not necessarily eradicate it completely. It might, it might, but more likely it's just going to take it to a lower level, which is good, but it's not perfect. Can a patient be on both topicals and Dupixent? A hundred percent. In fact, there was the Kronos study. Um, Dupixent did a study, a 52 week study that combined Dupixent and topical steroids compared to a group that was just using topical steroids by itself. And there was no increase in adverse events in the combination group. So absolutely. And almost every biologic now that's working on getting approved has done a study where they add topical steroids in conjunction with the biologic agent like Dupixent or like Lebrachizumab or like baricitinib. And they, so it's fine. It's, it's totally fine. Why do you think we're having more awareness, eczema now, awareness? I think awareness, but I also think as we become less of an agrarian society and more living in air conditioning and more living in isolation, I think we become less um, impacted by allergens early in life and therefore do not develop a normal immune response like humans should. And therefore I think we're like becoming like a little bit more like less gamey and a little bit more robotic. And therefore, I think we're having a more increase in, in eczema, um, asthma as well. Does a gluten-free diet help or decrease effects? No. <laughs> I mean, I've like, you know, looked into that, but, you know, give me a double blind placebo controlled study that shows it does and, and I'll, I'll buy it. But until then, no. Can eczema be mistaken for psoriasis? Not at Windsor Dermatology maybe somewhere else, but not here. We all know the difference between eczema and psoriasis. But the point is, we also know when the two can look similar. So we might have to do some biopsies or we might all pow out together to make sure we get the right diagnosis. So ultimately the answer is no, but preliminarily, yes. It might take a little bit of figuring it out. Because it doesn't, you, people don't come with, you know, a, a rash on their body that says, hi, I'm eczema or hi, I'm psoriasis. So we, we have to figure sometimes these things out. But, and sometimes even the biopsy looks a little funky, like a little, it's like it says spongiotic psoriasis, which means it's the two are the same. But what I've learned, if you start looking carefully at different regions, you could biopsy certain areas that are gonna come back as psoriasis. And you could biopsy certain areas on the same person that's gonna come back as eczema. As long as you look at the morphology and you can see that there are two of them are very distinguishable. Are there any dietary implications for eczema as well as things to avoid? It's a tough question. This is like, this question has been going on for, for years. And the bottom line is it doesn't seem so. I mean, you know, some people, I mean, I know that there are an increased frequency of food allergies in people that have eczema compared to people who don't have eczema. But having said that, I'm not sure in and of itself, you know, if you avoid milk or if you avoid eggs or if you avoid, it hasn't really ever been substantiated that there is a true definition between food allergies and eczema. Um, how about topical antimicrobial ointments like mupirocin or milder over-the-counter cream for children? Well, mupirocin would be good for people that have impetigenization, 
but over the counter like bacitracin or neospor, not so much. They're not specific enough. And also you can get allergies to them as well. So I think mupirocin is fair if it's a localized area that's infected, um, but larger areas of involvement, you might need bigger guns. Okay, so I think that wraps it up. I really appreciate all the questions. I'm happy that everybody came and I hope people continue to listen to the Windsor Dermatology you know, health skin highlights, healthy skin highlights. Yeah. Okay. And um, oh, next month is, oh, it's a real treat. Dr. Wendy Myers will be speaking on Cool Sculpt um, just in time for springtime and the summer. So pay attention, everybody. And remember, um, we do clinical trials with atopic dermatitis, as well as we take care of at least 50 to 75 people with eczema every week here amongst the eight providers at Windsor Dermatology. And if you need to get in, you call us up and we'll get you in. Okay. Thank you very, very much. Have a good evening. Okay.